the game that we're, the rules of the game that we're playing. So we're playing on a metric space, particularly the X um, is a Polish space, i.e. separable. separable um, metric uh, and better be complete. You can think Rn, but we will do some Rn and very quickly do much more fun things. But, and now here's how it works. There are two players, player one and player two. D1, D2, two players, and they Alternate, and you're given also, sorry, given, I'll call it a, a distinguished set within X. S can be any subset of X. We're going to ask questions about what happens if I pick different subsets. And here's how it goes Player one and player two alternate by picking subsets of your big metric spaces at X. Player one goes first, player two goes second, they alternate. You have four rules. When picking a new set, rule one. Um, so let's say if you pick a set, let's call the pick set I K for the KF set can't move. So one rule is I K plus one has to be a subset of I K. So our sets are generally getting smaller. We're also going to add a kind of technical te definition that girth of IK plus 1 is less than equal to 1 half girth of IK. So our shreds are getting smaller. Like this is strictly getting smaller and contained. Um, IK better be closed. And then finally, let's call the condition. Oh, yeah. The interior is not empty. Yes. Is the group the diameter of the set? So, yeah, the diameter, the, the large, you know, supremum is the net distance of two points within the set. So, yeah, I think diameter is a more common way to call this, but I guess my brain works in oh, the graph theory and my thing girth. <laughs> so, do the girths need to also be finite? Yeah, I just, let's just make it less than one. <laughs> Good point. Because if I'm in RN, you can just keep on picking the biggest set ever, and then nothing. So let's. Oh, I didn't even tell you why you're playing. <laughs> like, who wins? I just told you how to play. I always forget which one wins. Um, so P2 wins. I'll play P1. Player one wins. If. If there's a given IK that's just part, if it's not in your subset, or if intersection K. And then P2 wins, conversely, if IK is ever a subset of S, or So you're trying to get your set to be within, you know, you're, you're trying to get your move to live in the set S, and you keep on picking smaller and smaller sets. And you win in finite time if you just like actually get it fully in there, but sometimes you don't win in finite time and you have to go to infinite time, in which case you do that. So that's why these ors exist, and you can see, well, let's do a quick proposition. One and only one player wins. Well, if it's in finite time, only one of these can be satisfied. So finite time, I would say, is obvious. OK, infinite time. OK, well, I have a decreasing sequence of subset closed sets whose diameters are decreasing. What theorem, whose settings are basic, what theorem am I using? 
pulls on a virus drops or something. Yeah, I think Cantor intersection is the name for the general one, but yeah, pulls on a virus drops, Cantor intersection. Intersection says that the intersection over k and n by k is just a point. Some singleton point. And so that singleton point is either in S or in S complement. So someone wins, and only one person wins. All right, here we go. So I have, I've defined a decent game. There's, you know, might not be very fun to play, but definitely it has rules. Someone wins, that's great. All right, so let's play this game. Uh, I'm gonna be player one, you guys are player two. All of you collectively, it'll be a very fair game especially since I get to pick the set S. Um, <laughs> game one. Let's do S is equal to all, oh, sorry. For these games, X is gonna be R. Let's start with something that's not too bad. R minus Z. And then my first set, how about let's pick the interval from minus a third, one third, and just for fun, let's add the singleton set of one half. All right, anyone want to tell me a good second move for you guys? Can we do minus a third to minus a fourth? Yes. How about singleton zero? Singleton zero is not have empty <laughs> interior. You likewise cannot pick singleton one half because of that case. So, I heard a minus one third, a minus one quarter. Okay, well, union with that. That doesn't have <laughs> proper growth. It didn't shrink. Mm. Uh, union with negative one fifth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair. Well, I think I'm done, right? We are now fully in finite time and zone because. Wait, John, why didn't player one just pick a set that avoids S? <laughs> oh, he can't. I, no, I think P2 wins here, right? Like, yeah, you P2 to. just straight up won, right? Because this set is in here, right? This is a subset of R minus Z. And so we have found a finite set, I2, which is a subset of S. So player two one. And I claim there was nothing I could do. You guys could always win assuming you were intelligent. No matter what set I picked initially, you were gonna find a set in set. And so what property of RZ made this possible? Um, well, it was being a, an open dead set, right? Every interval I picked, you could pick a smaller interval with. So if S is open and dense, then P2 has a limiting expansion. And, okay, proof. I1 is anything. Note, it has an interior. S intersect I0 is an open set. <coughs> and it's not empty because of density. So there exists some x in the intersection, and there exists a delta greater than zero such that BR of zero closure is a subset of S, and then you pick R small enough to satisfy the girth condition, and then you're done. You just want Boom. R small enough. Great. Let's do something a little harder. Again, we're doing x equals r. And now, s equals r minus t. I'm going to pick something boring, 
like zero or one. Anyone want to tell me a good strategy you guys should be doing? Like, can you guys win? Who's going to win? Anyone know? You. No, I'm not going to win. Okay. Oh, well, I could win. You guys can just stop. <laughs> but let's let's do a let's do a brief let's do a side limit to help you. Here's the issue: yes. neither player wins the finite time. You agree with that? Yes. So this is a game that's going to go to infinity. Okay, well, <coughs> first define what a winning strategy is, because I've said this, but I didn't actually... I said winning strategy there, but I never even told you what a winning strategy is. So, definition winning strategy. Okay, so this is a function. It's a sequence of functions, fk, where fk takes in... Okay, well, let's, let's pick notation better. Um, play, let's do a winning strategy for d2. K in I better I better index in properly. Um, anyway, so fk is a set, is a function from um, the power set of, you know, our space you know, cross itself uh, 2k minus 2 times. So that's all, you know, you take in all of my moves and then you output your move. And I don't need to tell you what your previous moves are because you already know. Um, uh, why do you need all of the previous moves? So you're, some games are Markovian in the sense that you only care about the current state. This game is not one of those. You actually <laughs> need some, something about accountability means you need to at least know what move you're playing right now. Um, one way to encode that is just having all the previous moves, but you technically don't need that as long as it's a sequence of functions in the case on matter. You could in this game get away about it, but. In generic game theory, it's I take in all of your previous moves and I have to find them. Because in theory, somehow the game state might not depend solely on what it is right now, but what happened in the past. And like this is this is all possible subsets of actions. Yeah, so like, I said two uh, yeah, admissible sets. Admissible moves. Admissible sequences or something. Or just like there's an equivalence relation on winning strategies where they're the same if they agree on this Yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, yeah. Details. Yeah. But it's it's a function that takes in your previous moves and outputs yeah. my moves. And such that I guess I should say for all admissible like if I two K is admissible after f two k of i zero add one i whatever i index things terribly whatever if if it's if it's an admissible move after my last move then intersection of draw k. The intersection of all the moves is then in S. So I don't care what moves you pick. If you move any McKinney pick, I have a resulting move. If we do play the game to intuition or fruition, I win. Yes. So right. player two wins? Yes. Uh, so this is the player two winning strategy. Oh, that is the winning strategy. I'm just saying definition of a winning strategy is it's a function from 2K moves. It's a sequence of functions that take in the previous k moves and output the next move. And if you provide me with next moves, I always win. I'm a little confused by the indexing. The indexing is terrible, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, okay, I think for this game, for this game it doesn't really matter, so we could just do it's a game from 2x, 2x, 
and then if you gave me, like, this is player one's move, or player two's move, or no, this is player one's move. So player one's moves are I1 or I K to K minus one. So then my 2kf move is exactly. Oh gosh. We're playing player two. So player one picks a move. Yeah, wait, my indexing is very much off. Okay. Oh, wait, this equals I2. Right. F outputs my kf move, which is the 2kf move for the entire game. And so I2k plus 1 is admissible after this guy. And we inductively have this being the case. So for all k, you pick me, you pick a, an admissible next move, and then this function tells you the, the move after that, and then you tell me you move, and the function picks move, et cetera, et cetera. Then if you play this game to infinity, then player two wins. Is that, is I don't know if that made more sense. This is for all choices of i2k plus one? Yeah. I see. So like, no matter how you respond. It, you know, I, the function doesn't, you know the function before. Yeah. Like, I can tell you how I'm going to play tic-tac-toe, and you cannot beat me. Like, I can tell you I'm going to do a top left corner, for, I'm going to do like a middle first, and then I'll do like a, a corner according to whatever rule set, and all that. And if you know that, even with all that knowledge, you can't beat me. I mean, it's going to talk, because tic-tac-toe is a bad game, you can't talk. <laughs> but like, a winning strategy does it stop being a winning strategy if you tell the other player a strategy. Cool. So here's a little prop. If I can win, if P2 wins with S and S prime, then P2 by wins, I mean it has a winning strategy, wins with S intersect, S prime. And what do they do? Well, I erase my rules. I just pretend all of your odd moves were a game and all of your even moves were a game. Because if you skip a number of moves, it's still admissible after the first move. Because the only thing that makes invisibility is subsets, that's still subsets. The girth condition is just stronger now. Um, interiors are still defined and still closed. So all your conditions, you can jump some number of moves ahead. So then you just like alternate strategies. So maybe with that hint, anyone have a, a way, an idea of how to maybe try and win game two? Not using the hint. <laughs> um, <laughs> on each move, make sure that you eliminate the nth rational number. Yeah. How does so, that use the hint? Okay, well, the hint is finite intersection. This strategy works with the diagonalization argument. If T2 doesn't just have a winning strategy for S, if it does for count the collection of S's, I and M, then it also wins with intersection over I and N of SI. And okay, now I can't alternate moves, but I take the diagonalization and enumeration of N cross N. And like, this is the, the first index is which set you're playing to win and that's which move in the game Okay, and this should better be a, a good enumeration such that like it's like ordered in the right way. I don't somehow move the, take the second move and then take the first move. Ordered well. <coughs> Set theory is annoying. Then this one. I'm not gonna do the detail, this is the geo so talk. You guys believe me that a di diagonalization wins, and a diagonalization, as you kind of suggested, of eliminating the nth rational at each move wins. All right. 
So we have open-ended set swim and countable intersections of open-ended set swim. All right, so that means we have every co-meter set length. <laughs> you want to make a, a wild guess? Well, when you win and when you lose. I've had a bunch of one of those here's the theorem. P2 wins if and only if S is co -meter. And I already did one direction for you. The other direction is interesting. Um, <laughs> all right. For, Sorry, co-meter just means kind of intersection of open dense sets? Yes. Okay, thanks. It's complement is meager, which is, yeah. Yeah, but I didn't remember which, either of those. Meager is small, so co-meager has to be big. Okay, yeah. Wait. <laughs> Question. So, are we saying that the winning strategy for player one is the same as the complement, or? So, uh, it's not quite, it's right? Yeah, it's not because open. player one can win instantly on weird sets. Like, what if, S was zero one. Player one can win that because they just picked zero one. So player one actually wins if there is an open set in which, or if there's, let's just say, there's a closed set on which you are co-meter, and like the induced metric topology nonsense. You can reduce it to just being there's a closed ball on which you are. You win. So that's, it's not perfectly symmetric. Player one kind of can cheat on these certain sets, but otherwise, yes. That's why we typically care about player two, because it doesn't cheat. And then once you know player, once you add this small caveat, you also have the winning strategies for player one. Because you just make, if you don't win on the first move, well, you can win on the first move or guarantee that you're going to win by changing the, the starting space. Cool. So, let's say I have a winning strategy, or let's say you guys have a winning strategy, because you guys are player two. As a winning strategy, so I need to somehow, using this fact, write S as a countable intersection of open and dense sets. Okay, well, I have a Polish space, so I better say, I better use that somewhere. Um, which my countable, I'll uh, make my basis B or basis countable basis. You can think about this as like, if you don't like mid or point set, these are balls of radio, rational length around rational points or interceptable, yeah. whatever. Um, and so I need to just, yeah. Win. So, here's the thing. If you give me any open set, I can really just consider we have a metric space. I'm actually going to make it of balls, and then you can just consider the set, the like closures of these balls if you want to. So those are all in particular plays. Uh, okay, great. I need to. I need to remember this. Me ad living without notes is only going to go so far. Um, okay. So we need to define some crazy sets. Wait. There exists a collection. Open sets. V, you're gonna have two indices, AJ. Um, and these sets need to have certain properties. V, J, K intersect. Are these, uh, yeah. Um, intersect each of these balls in a non-empty manner. 
Um, else do I need? And, oh yes. And, oh sorry, this actually isn't the condition I need. What I need is, if I just make it a single set f j k of move of f j k intersects the i not empty if I take the interior. So there exists for all j or for all i there exists a j such that. So Okay, you could if I'm if I make this a count of collection of moves, then instead of BK, it's a B1, B2, B3, B4. There's a selection of J's and K's depending on each other, such that the function of the first K move, first K sets, gives me output something which intersects this open ball non-trivially. And this interior does this. That's um, intuition behind this. Um, so in, in particular, these guys need to have finite girth and so on? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I guess these guys are, um, which, okay, how should I say this? Which are, I should say, admissible after some f k minus one B k minus one j. Uh, I also want them to be disjoint. Yeah. Closure and it's full. The open closed condition you're gonna see we're gonna really I I ignore it so often. You're gonna see why you ignore it because you just keep on you just half your radius and take your closure and yeah everything else. Um you're just gonna get a flavor for this proof right now. Okay, so I have this crazy thing. I claim this exists. I claim that I have these collections of disjoint. Actually, let's make them just closed. And then this this still makes sense to take their interior. So I have a collection of disjoint moves that I can make after BK such that after you make your, I make this move knowing that you're going to pick something and if I take all the moves, all the games we played simultaneously, all of them is dead. Like the collection of all these things is dead. And actually they're interior so I So, I mean, we're kind of building this up to get a G delta, or you know, an intersection of open and dead sets. So what, how do I even do this? This proof is actually, the claim is not that bad. Proof of claim. Okay, it's kind of inductive. What do you do? Okay. <clears throat> Fix EJ. Either one of these already exists. Um, like you, you build K up from the ground. So either there exists EJK in my set that works. Or what happens if not? Okay, nothing in my set, if you make the next move intersects BJ, all right. Well, I know there exists K, oh gosh, I need more indices. This is called K sprinkle, J sprinkle, such that F K minus one of I guess this is, this K is actually well done, fine. J squiggle is the only thing that's weird. This thing interior intersects the I, not trivially. And so what I do is, okay, that has a, a point, there's a point in that intersection, and it's non trivial, and it's open, so there's a radius. I can shrink that radius to meet girth conditions, and I can half it again and take its closure, so therefore it's closed down. So there exists B, R, X, closure, admissible, and there, and I make that my move. 
Because then your next move has to be in that ball. It has to have non-empty interior. So it's going to know that we have to be in this intersection and have non-empty interior. So it's non-empty interior has to be in this intersection. So I just, if I want you to be in this open set, and you were already, I just force you into the open set by picking a small ball with it. And then you pick something else, but it's still in that open set. And what I can do now is what are my open? I claim S contains the intersection of, I think it's over K, the unions over J of the interior. Interior. Next. Uh, these are open and dense. Because they're admissible, they're definitely open. Like these things are dense because you know these condition, this condition about the intersection of interior ensures that these guys intersect every open set. So they're definitely dense. Um, and then, so this is definitely an open uh, inter countable intersection of open intense sets. I claim it contains S. The reason I claim that is for every sequence of these moves, or for every point in the intersection, I want to be careful about this intersection. Is it F that specific? No, I think that's. Oh, remember I chose, I, one of the things I added randomly was disjoint. If you're in the intersection of all these guys, there's only one thing in each level you can be in. Because these, this is a union of disjoint closed sets whose interior is dense. So if you're in the intersection, I actually know exactly what game we played. Because there is a sequence of open sets going up of what game we played. So we're played, we played infinitely many games simultaneously. And I forced you to pick that these games were in dense sets all the time. So if you're in here, then you just pick the, the J's such that they are all the only ones that are in this intersection and it tails you off to the top. And so we played a game, you won because you have the winning strategy, so this intersection better be an S, and so that subset. That. That's on a red square. Questions, because that was a little hand wavy. We showed that S contains a co-meager set. Yes. That, that implies that S is co-meager? Yes. Okay. I believe you. <laughs> yeah, you, home your sets are like, and they're like, yes. I mean, that's cool. really more by definition that like coke. So like, it's not the case that any set that contains a, a coke, so that any set that contains an intersection of countable dense sets is itself an intersection. I see. Uh, the co-meager means contains intersection. Yeah, it means contain. Yeah. Or contains an intersection kind of open. Dense. Yeah, open dense. Yeah. Next. Yeah. Next. But this is a kind of intersection of open dense sets. S contains that super. Woo. Uh, yeah. So this is the crazy proof. Um, and now that we have this, what can we do? Well, we can we can start trying to tell if things are first category or not. By just playing this game. <laughs> <laughs> this goes until 16. Okay, so I have plenty of time. We can do all kinds of fun examples. So all we need is a metric space. And then we can say, like, okay, let's pick out a set and see if, you know, see if it's called meeker or not. Um, <laughs> how we can do that, we're gonna play a game. It's fun. Fun for the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> so the rest of the talk is me. I have a few games in mind. That. So here's a good warm up. Um, one another space S. Or, sorry, I'm going to get the X first. X is non or strictly increasing sequences in natural numbers. X 
animal sequences of natural numbers that are in this. And what if S is sequences such that um, 1 over SI sum I, well, let's just say equals plus infinity. So we're playing with increasing sequences, and we ask, do most of the sequences, if I take the reciprocal, some of the reciprocals, they diverge? And I gotta give you a metric, but yes. Yeah, okay, that was good. Enough, right? Yes, I better give you a metric on the space. It's not a polar space until I give you a topology metric. So the metric is that which is, I mean, there, there are two metrics, but they have the same topology. That, that's then induced by the product topology on, I mean, you can either just do the normal topology or the discrete topology, they're the same. Um, it's product topology on useful metric. So if you want to see what this is exactly, like rho of a sequence xi, yj, is equal to sum 1 over 2 to the n, n equals 1 plus infinity of uh, norm xi minus yi over 1 plus norm xi minus yi. This is bounded. The sum is always less than 1. It's positive. You can check if sign on the side is triangle inequality. You can also check if you're close to two things, you have to have so many digits in common. So this is actually is uh, complete. If you have a sequence as Cauchy, you're just telling me more and more of the terms of your sequence, and so I just take the limit and you definitely get this thing. And it's um, separable. Yeah, I mean, just, that's not hard to count for. Or it's not hard to count for. Yeah, that's a lot. But pick a number of sequences, you know, pick sequences with finite number of digits, and then just let it be one over n afterward. Just increasing one over. Standardly, and that's going to be countable and dense. And now we're good. Okay. So let's play. Anyone have any ideas for a good funding strategy for player two? So when you when you pick a closed set here, yes, you're you should think in balls. I should say this. Hopefully, this is not clear. It was clear. You should think. I'm given an open ball because I'm just going to deal with the interior, and I'm going to pick a smaller ball within that. And so, what are balls in this space? It's you told me in some number of digits, and I can pick as small of balls I want. So I can then tell you as many other digits as I want to. All right, so I'm gonna pick, <laughs> I'm gonna be really mean. I'm gonna pick one over a thousand, because the ball of radius is so small that you don't know what it is. The first digit's one over a thousand. What should I do next? What should you guys do to have through, through the harmonic sequence and not to get an additional one half yes. factor? <laughs> However long you need to go, one over K such that this sum is greater than one half or one or whatever number you want, whatever fixed constant you want. And no matter what I pick, you then do this again. Pick a whole heck of a lot of sequences, so you add another one. And we sum the harmonic series, and well, it's infinite because you guys picked it, so it has enough of the harmonic series to always be larger than any integer, and so it's infinite. That's a proof, right? You guys give that full credit, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was one fun space. Um, yes. What were my other fun ones? Oh, yes. Wait, sorry. Can you tell me what we con concluded and, if possible, what it means for sequences? P2 has a winning strategy, which was, if you. 
my move is always just pick enough of the harmonic series so that the sum of the next n terms is one or like half, and then pick a small enough radius around that harmonic series so that you, you have to pick some of that same first however many digits. Like what do they say about cofinger? And so that says that this set S is co-meager, which topologically says that most increasing sequences, the sum of their reciprocals diverges. Hmm. Some sense of most. Uh, I mean, we should be very careful, you know, this is the topological notion of mo most, this is, you know, completely orthogonal to measure theoretic sense senses of most, so. What, what's, what does most kind of, for sequences, like what? I mean, <laughs> it means it's a, it's a <laughs> set. I, like, so go to your sets there, nice because they're so large that you take a countable intersection of them, not only do you still get something left over, you get another co-meter set. So it's like a notion of large is if I try to make you smaller, I didn't actually make you smaller. So these like irrational for like co-meter. And like you have to be like, also they're not out here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe sort of like countable complements on like the real line. Uh, oh, speaking of the real line, I promised something to you guys in my abstract. This game has a very fun property. Every player wins every game. Every game someone wins. But there is a game in which one player wins, but both players played optimally, and neither one ever had a winning strategy. This is typically false in most game theory, because most game theory has games that end in finite time. But this game does not end in finite time most of the time. So let's, 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 let's talk about what I'm saying. Okay, first of all, I define optimal move by, if I have an optimal strategy, I play by it. If I don't have an optimal strategy and you don't have an optimal strategy, I make a move so that you don't have an optimal strategy. Like, if I can win, I win. If I cannot lose, I don't lose. So, as all good arguments start, let V be the Vitaly set. <laughs> Um, this is a basis uh, for R as a Q vector space. Uh, vector space. Uh, in case you guys don't remember what Vitaly said is, but it's one irrational number in every you know, rational quotient. Um, great. Let um, C the subset of Q, which is dense. And Q minus C is also dense. You can pick it like rational numbers whose in least terms the lower number is even versus odd works. And I guess zero is even, sure, one is even, or I guess one. Yeah, you know, this works. So let S equal. Since all the C translates of Vitaly set B, um, you can check this is neither meager nor co meager, and its intersection of every open set is neither meager nor co meager. Um, if it were, that would imply that the Vitaly set were meager or co meager. And the Vitaly set, if it were meager, I can write it all of R as a countable union of translates, and R has a nice topology, so meager, if you know only if your translate's meager. So, that would be a contradiction because I can write the entire space as a union of meager sets, which is never true. Um, so V can't be meager, and so this definitely can't be meager. Um, but neither can its complement for the like, same reasons. And so that guy's neither meager nor co meager in every open set. Or I guess you have to do some more work if you want to say in every open set. But this means I can just move whatever I want. I can just keep on, you and I can just keep on picking sets that are admissible. And every move is optimal because neither of us has a money strategy. No matter what I give you, it's still optimal. <laughs> Yet, if we keep on picking moves back and forth, back and forth, someone wins. 
I don't know. Don't we know player one wins? Because we know that player two wins if and only if the set is weaker. And we know That's a winning one. strategy. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I agree that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. But yes, it was very key that that function f is the winning strategy, not the, because like, player one could just be an idiot sometimes and, you know, you can have things where, you know, again, pick s to be something like zero, one, and if player one decides to pick zero, one as the move, well, I guess they won, but like, they had a winning strategy. It was pick two to three, or whatever it is. So, the if and only is very clearly for, are you carefully cut up? Sorry, I forgot to mention this, but this is a fun counter example in game theory. All right, cool fun sets, um, fun topologies. So let X be the space of compact subsets of Rn. Note that we are playing a game on this, so we're on the power on the set of compact sets of Rn. Not bad. All right. And then I need to give you a metric. Um, the distance between A and B is uh, elsewhere distance. You want non empty compact subsets? <laughs> Which, if you don't remember what the Hausdorff distance is, it's like soup over X and A, or imp and Y and B, a distance between. X and B, the maximum of this, and then I swap the order. So Y and B, and X and A, distance. Pretty much if I have two closed sets, I can say the distance is like the closest any two points are to each other on these two sets. Cool. You can check if you do closed balls, closed, finite combinations of closed balls with rational lengths and rational endpoints. That's a, a countable dense subset of this space. So it's separable. You can check it's complete because if you give me the tail set, which is intersection, a in union of in bigger than k of moves, bi and closure, this, if bi form a Cauchy sequence, this converges to a compact set. It is a compact set because these are closed and you can check it's bounded by like being close to the metric. This is a compact set and you can show it actually is converges to this. So it's a complete metric space. And we can play a game on it. And uh, I claim, let's play with s, to be cancer sets. I. Okay, what do I mean by cancer set? I mean totally disconnected. And no isolated points. Alright, so if I'm a compact set that's totally disconnected and no isolated points on the cancer, I'm at least. Equivalent to the intersection side in some sense. All right. Any uh, any thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> so like, it's a little technical. I'm going to give you a sketch. But if you give me a set, a closed set, I can always, and it's a ball around that set. I can always buff it out by a little bit, right? If I take the set which is B R. Zero, where plus is like algebraic plus, so every point in here plus a point in here, that set. This set, and that's this is a compact set, this is a compact set. And this thing has distance from this guy of at most r. Actually, exactly r. So I can always buff you out a little bit. And then what I do is I I do this so it's like epsilon, if you give me a ball already, it's epsilon, I do this so Epsilon, and then what I do is I say, oh, this prevents you from being isolated. And then what I do is I chop this thing up, these balls, into a bunch of little small pieces and cut them into 
So like then remove a small grid. You can say like, you know, if you take if you just take normal grid of width, like if it's the KF move R over 100, I don't like mean K. Um, uh, let's do R over 10,000 with uh, grid length R of 100. So what I did is I said every point in your set, I'm going to make it into a, a big ball, big as an R, and then I'm going to say is to I'm now going to remove like that. And it's about the thickness of my chart. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to set the, my node to be the ball around this, a radius, uh, say, r over 10 million should be good enough. Because then, no matter what, every point has friends that are destined. I always ensure that every point has a friend nearby, and you cannot get rid of this friend, because some friend in this box lives. You can't get rid of all of it, otherwise that would be distance less than r over 10 million from mine. So every point has a friend distance r, and r is decreasing away. And so that prevents you from being totally isolated, disconnected. But you also can check all your connected components has to have Diameter decreasing like r over 100 or so. And so, what's the diameter of your connected component as we play forever? It goes to zero. So, all your connected components have zero diameter. I'm pretty sure that means you're totally disconnected unless I screwed something up and it's going to yell at me. No, I'm, I'm, so just to check, we like, we're playing this game. P1 plays a set of non empty compact subsets yeah. of r. We look at that set is guaranteed to have non-empty interior. I take a point in the interior of the yes. set. I call that C. Yes. I do this construction. I produce a new set C prime. I take a tiny ball of radius R over ten million around C prime, yes. where I pick R ahead of time from ten million. Yes. So I had yes. and then yes. Yes. Exactly. okay, all right, exactly. It it's it boils down to every time we play this game, you can say you picked you picked a set. I don't care what set you picked. You picked a point and a ball around that point. And now I'm going to pick a point in a very small ball around that point, and then, okay, closure it, or half the radius and then closure it, or whatever. That, that's how I play these games, and it, it's good enough. All right, five minutes left. We're going to solve a classic 240A 5A problem using all this material. So. This is a problem I did in undergrad analysis. And grad analysis. Um, there exists a set S, I'd say a big measurable, subset of the interval 0 or 1, such that the big measure of S intersect AB is less than the big measure of AB. Greater than zero. A, B, U, can intersect. So I have a set which is partial measure everywhere. So prove there exists a set like this. So what we're going to do instead, we're going to prove the set, prove the set of these things is co-meager, and so it has to be one. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, I forgot to say. What, what did I conclude? This is co-meager, so in fact, every set is pretty much, almost every set is a canter set. So, you know, topologists. They know what they're doing when they like the canter set so much, because I mean, you might as well just forget about everything else, right? <laughs> that, that's the talk, right? No, all sequences diverge, and all sets are canter sets. All compact closed sets are canter sets. Who knows about the other one? All right, that's good topic. And also, every measurable set is partial measure. Yeah. Uh, sorry if this is traumatizing, but wasn't there an analysis qual problem like this? I think there was an analysis qual problem like this too. Okay. Is that how you did it? <laughs> what? You prove is this how you did it? 
<laughs> no, no. Oh, okay. I, no, there are much slicker ways to do it, but this is fun. Okay, all right. So, okay, what's our set X? Our set X is going to be Lebade measurable subsets of 0, 1, modulo sets of measurements. So actually, I'm going to show that there's an equivalence class. The equivalence class of these is dense, so just pick one element in the equivalence sex class. And then, what's the metric D? It's the Lebesgue measure of two sets, AB. It's the Lebesgue measure of asymmetric difference B. This is obviously a metric. Since we're on 0, 1, this is separable. Be careful if you try and do this everywhere else. This if you want to do it for the whole right line, you should do it for all 0, 1, and then just copy it over, because that space is not separable in the other things, right? It's just a subspace. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, separable, it's complete, um, because it is. Just <laughs> do, do another tail set, you know, do like kind of a little intersection of the kind of a union of your sets A and I. I greater than M, and that would give you your limit. It's the only thing you can do. Um, great. And then what do I do? I pretty much mirrored this exact construction. I get let AI be our, just consider it like AI be I, that's only point zero. And then it moves. Okay. Add a ball of radius r, then remove a ball of radius small, much smaller than r, and then make the distance the, the distance that you're allowed to move really tiny so that there's definitely still that ball missing, and there's definitely some part of that ball that's still uh, that we kept. So like if you get me an interval here. I have a very small amount I'm allowed to add, but I add something like this, such that. And then I say, you can't change more than that much of a page, so maybe I should close this up. I make a set that's like this in the giant, and then I make the radius so that you can't change more than this much of the set. So therefore, something positive's there, and something's missing if this is big enough in the interior. So, intersects this set with non-full measure, non-empty measure. Play the game. Hey, look, the final endpoint was neither full measure nor empty measure in every, every rational endpoint in open set, or interval sets, every rift interval. And so, it exists. Obviously, it's so easy. Why, why was this even a ball problem? You can just <laughs> throw a dart and you'll hit the right one, right? <laughs> All right, that's it for today. Yeah? Are there any, like, children's games or something where you're, like, tic-tac-toe that can be encoded like, somehow? Or, like, any, any game that... I don't really know game theory, but is there anything? I have no clue about it in my game theory. This is just fun topology. Um, <laughs> Maybe tic tac toe can't be encoded because this game doesn't allow ties. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, maybe, maybe we could pick some, like, or like game. Well, I guess this game couldn't be tic tac toe because this game can't have ties. Yeah. But if you're giving a game that doesn't have, that doesn't have ties, you could probably encode it for point. As long as like it has a finite number of moves, it's like have some sort of like weird thing where oh no, you still can't. Um, the, I didn't show this to you guys, but there's a proof. Games can either end in one move or an infinitely many moves, and there's no in between. It's not many games. Uh, so <laughs> well, but that's true of like decided games in game theory, also, right? Yeah, I mean, but it, like the, the like ends in finite moves condition I wrote was just to make my life easier. But like in reality, you can kind of like it's kind of almost ignored because if you did it win in three moves and both players playing optimally, then you're just not going to end this Yeah, it seems like a lot of the constructions of winning strategies that we've done were relatively independent of the particular choice of metric that you used here. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm wondering how far I can go with that. In particular, can I 
I have removed the growth condition on this with a purely topological condition. Like maybe the every close is in like the interior of the. Yeah. So the the only reason the growth condition exists, it doesn't actually change the game all that much. What it does do is it ensures that there's a single winner. Because you could worry you don't have a growth condition that you and I just like stalemate and we just keep on picking the same thing. So you could place a growth condition with the intersection of all of them as a single point. Yeah. Sure. If you if you, if you if you play that, I mean, the issue is is you do have to eventually like you can't force one player to like not play. Well, you just actually, I think you sure gave force one player to like you don't actually but change the condition. You said all of them being a single. No, you, like when I play a given move, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. This is a condition on the entire s sequence of really many moves. The only time has that some rules, but winning strategy is a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it needs to be something like this, because you can't just say, like, if I go through it, there's a topological way to do that. that isn't metric. I can't think of one. Well, because it's, it's using the completeness, and that's purely <laughs> metric based, right? I can, re I can make a new topology, which isn't a trans. Like, <laughs> <clears throat> new metric, which is equivalent to the old metric, but it's not quite that new metric. I guess it really is approvable that like, all this stuff is independent of the choice of metric all like every move. I mean, yeah, I guess so, because like co metering condition doesn't oh, okay. It only depends on the uh, the topological yeah. topology, so yeah. So a lot of these strategies were uh, take the thing your opponent played, take something in the interior do some things, blah, 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 blah. Or like in this case, like enumerate the rationals and like do something. Yeah. But we have to like make all these choices in there. Yeah. In order to construct the entire <laughs> uh, the entire strategy as this big sequence of functions, do I have to like pick a well-ordering on the set Maybe. of Lubang subsets of R? I don't know. There, there's a decent, there's, I assume a choice probably exists in this construction. I don't know. I mean, I just stayed up to find them, that's all I said. So I mean, like, <laughs> you might, some of these games you could probably play with animal choice, but I think, I think you're, I think you're going to need to at least use that. But I'm not, I'm not a sad so maybe I'm wrong. Fixed. Yeah. Are there slots like, of one um, that are, like, is it, do we know if there is a, like, are there sets where, then winning for player one is a statement independent of CSC. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, like you, you mentioned this set with the Vitaly set where we don't know if player one or player two wins. Are there sets which are provably independent of CSC? So, so the, the thing about the Vitaly set is one player, win, it somehow, depending, if two players can play multiple games, these games can be optimal and different players can win different games. There, there are like many optimal ways to play the Vitaly set game. And, and that's it's some of these that optimal ways you lose. Mm. <laughs> if the Vitaly set exists, then there's like no optimal, there's no winning strategy for I player one or player one two. One way it works is, I think if you gave me your strategy, I can always exploit it to win. Like, a winning strategy has to be that if I tell you my winning strategy, I still win. And I'm pretty sure you can prove with like that Vitaly set, if you told me your strategy, I could win. I could pick a I could pick a sequence based on your strategy that would win. And so that's kind of like where things kind of break. It's like, oh, you kind of have a good strategy, but it doesn't work if you tell it to me. Because if you tell me it, then I can like, counteract it. Yeah. I mean, don't play countable games if, because they have weird things like this. Or play them because they have crazy things like this. Yeah. As a consequence of the theorem we proved, yeah. axiom of determinacy question mark implies that every subset of bare space is either co meager or meager in a standard topological ball or something. Say this again? Or like axiom of determinacy says that. Axiom of determinacy says that every game in bare space has a winning strategy. Okay. And we just showed that 
certain games have winning strategies for player two if this if and only if a certain set is co -meager. Yeah. So I think there's some like consequence here about like yeah, if that accident sounds like see, then you get a bunch of results about what sets in pairs basically. Yeah. I mean you have to be careful because this is I'm not full of generality. I didn't like I'm not in bears like bear spaces are slightly larger than polar spaces. Every polar space is there, but the other way it don't think it's there, right. Yeah, I mean specifically the space and so, the end or something. So this is saying something only about Polish spaces, but yeah, it does sound like you're you just make some claim kind of about Polish spaces because of this. Alright, let's think. Oh, yeah.